The Chicago Idea and Idealism by Evander Bradley McGilvery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Chicago Idea and Idealism by Evander Bradley McGilvery. Every fundamentally new attempt at reconstruction in science involves, to some extent at least, a new terminology. The old words of a language may still be employed, but they are made to carry new meanings, and it is the task of the attentive reader to keep from slipping back into the old meanings when he would understand the new message. This commonplace reflection is suggested by the present status of the pragmatistic controversy. Professor Dewey has repeatedly complained that his critics have failed to understand him because they have interpreted what he says as if he were employing old words in their old meanings. The complaint is amply justified. And, of course, this misunderstanding is a bar to any true appreciation of his instrumental logic. There is no word which is apt to give more trouble to Professor Dewey's readers than the word idea. The fault is not Professor Dewey's, for he has taken great pains to make clear just what he means by the term. But what he means is so different from what is ordinarily meant that it is no wonder that his critics have failed to remain true to his definition when they try to appraise the value of his statements about ideas. For instance, when one finds this challenge thrown down by Professor Dewey, do ideas present themselves except in situations which are doubtful and inquired into? Footnote, this journal, volume 5, page 378, in footnote, one is apt to take up the gauntlet with confident heart, for does not everyone know that ideas do present themselves constantly in situations which are untroubled by any doubt? But the cautious reader knows that the gauntlet has a string attached to it, and may not be lightly taken up. In this paper, I shall try to state as best I may the new meaning of idea in Professor Dewey's writings, and then ask some questions which this new meaning suggests. But before doing this, let us take a brief survey of the current meanings of the term. The word idea has at least two different types of meaning in common use. These two meanings can be traced back in English to Locke and Hume. They may be called the inclusive and the exclusive significations of the word. Locke used the word of everything of which we are conscious when we think. Hume used it in antithesis to impression. And since their days, not to go farther back, both these usages have been classic. Of course, the particular nuance which the term has in either sense is determined by the views which are held in regard to the genesis and the function or reference of ideas. And these views are various. For instance, Lotze, like Locke, set over against the world of ideas used inclusively a world of reality outside of ideas, which ideas are to deal with as well as they can. Professor Dewey has shown with masterly skill how Sisyphean is the task which is set for ideas in this scheme of things. The idealist, also using idea in the inclusive sense, denies that there is any reality that is not idea. He has, therefore, no need to make ideas adjust themselves to a reality which is not ideal. The only adjustment necessary is among the ideas themselves. Hume, taking the term in an exclusive sense, finds, however, no work cut out for ideas in the fact that they are not exhaustive of reality. They carry no reference to the other class of realities. All they have to do is be more or less lively, and the laws of association manage this business for them. The psychologist of the present day is apt to use the word in the exclusive sense fixed by Hume. But, following the hint given by Hume himself, although not developed by him, the psychologist regards ideas as those elements in experience that are due to central stimulations of the cortex, as opposed to sensations which are due to peripheral stimulations. The plain man uses the term in a manner similar to that adopted by the psychologist, although of course he has very vague notions of the basis of the distinction between idea and sensation. I think that it can properly be said that the psychological employment of the term is merely a refined and critical adaptation of the vulgar use. Now, when ideas are used in this way in antithesis to sensation, it may be recognized that they not only are occurrences accounted for by their connection with brain processes, but also are in some way the vehicles of knowledge. They have not only a structure and a genesis, but also a function and a value determined by the success with which they perform their function. This function is knowing. The examination of this function and of the value of ideas in this functional process is generally turned over by the psychologist to the epistemologist. 
if the latter takes up the problem on its own account and ignores the psychological problems of structure and genesis we have then two abstract sciences standing side by side much to the scandal of pragmatists and humanists the division of labor is regarded as an ultimate and hopeless scission of the material taken in hand the living unity of experience is dissected into dead members and where is the isis to gather up the scattered anatomy of experience and where is the ezekiel to prophesy upon the dead bones that they may live there is no goddess in egypt and no prophet in israel these days but we have the pragmatist who can see to it that the default of supernatural beings shall not be fatal to natural human knowing he employs an ounce of prevention where they would have resorted to tons and tons of miraculous cure he would have no division of labor between psychology and epistemology for of course division of labor is division of what you labor on and this is to be avoided at all hazards one unspecialized type of laborer is to be employed on the work and this secures unity of finished product assembling is an impossibility in manufacture hence do nothing that will make it necessary the logician can do all the work and keep the parts together from start to finish this of course necessitates a new terminology in the factory the real trouble with the antiquated method is found in the kind of distinction that is made between ideas meanings thoughts ways of conceiving comprehending interpreting facts suggestions guesses theories estimates etc on the one hand and facts objects data and what not on the other these are not forever fixed in their eternal state else they have done with things below they are simply instrumental distinctions functional variants and are just what at any time you take them to be of course even thus you cannot get rid of the distinctions and so cannot get rid of division of labor but you have a different kind of division of labor the division here falls upon the material which the logician studies not upon the students of the material as this material is living reflective experience it can temporarily endure all sorts of tensions and distractions taking these up and working them over till it affects a reorganization indeed without this tension and distraction there would be no thinking life but the student of this life must not divide what in life is connected even in its division so that while in this new way of ideas datum and ideatum are divisions of labor cooperative instrumentalities for economical dealings with the problems of the maintenance of the integrity of experience the logician must recognize that either is a sheer abstraction from the standpoint either of the organized experience left behind or of the reorganized experience which is the end the objective footnote studies in logical theory page 52 the second quotation is taken out of its narrower context where the subject of the sentence is a particular datum namely mere change of apparent position of sun which is absolutely unquestioned as datum but the larger context i think justifies the use to which i have put this clause in footnote thus the distinction between subjectivity and objectivity is not one between meaning as such and datum as such it is a specification that emerges correspondently in both datum and ideatum as affairs of the direction of logical movement that which is left behind in the evolution of accepted meaning is characterized as real but only in a psychical sense that which is moved toward is regarded as real in an objective cosmic sense footnote opera catato pages fifty three to fifty four end footnote the psychic the ideal on the one hand the cosmic the objective on the other are thus nothing but shifting values in an ever-growing unity of experience just what shift is made is determined by the problem and its solution in any definite concrete situation when an intellectual problem is taken up in experience there is always something that for the time being is accepted as fact this is the datum there is something else which is suggested as somehow appertaining to this fact this is idea the idea may be subsequently rejected in the outcome of thought's travail it is then definitively for this occasion characterized as merely psychic on the contrary the suggestion may be accepted it then merges with the datum after the latter has been correspondingly changed to receive the suggested content and it ceases to be an idea for the occasion and becomes objective cosmic fact not only is this shifting according to the concrete emergencies and the concrete achievements of the logical process a fate which befalls ideas and data it likewise draws into its kaleidoscopic field even the term sensation and image one of the aims of the studies in logical theory was to show that such distinctions as sensation image etc mark instruments and crises in the development of control judgment i e of inferential conclusions footnote 
This journal, volume 5, page 376. End footnote. Whether any experience is to be considered sensational is not determined then by resort to psychophysical investigation, except perhaps when the problem is psychophysical and not logical, but by consideration of the harmonious outcome of the previously disturbed situation. We are not told whether sensation is synonymous with accepted fact, but we are at any rate warned not to consider it in terms of the psychology which obtained in the critic's mind. Footnote, Ibid, page 377. End footnote. Now these are perfectly clear distinctions, and although I may not have done justice to the clean-cut thought in which this view is worked out, still I hope that I have blocked the distinctions out sufficiently for recognition by their author and by others. But what follows? I think that we must agree that one thing follows, namely, the necessity of giving just the kind of answer that Professor Dewey gives to the five sets of questions which he asks on page 378 of the current volume of this journal. According to this new definition of ideas and of facts, ideas do not present themselves except in situations which are doubtful and inquired into. They do not exist side by side with the facts to which they refer when these facts are themselves known. They do not exist except when judgment is in suspense. They are nothing but the suggestions, conjectures, hypotheses, theories, tentatively entertained during a suspended conclusion, and so forth and so forth. These answers are determined by the definitions already given of fact and idea, and no examination of actual thinking experience is necessary for making the appropriate reply. All one has to do is to examine the definitions of the terms used. Just as in Euclidean geometry, all that one has to do in determining whether parallel lines meet is to consult the definition of parallel lines. The scheme is beautifully simple, and if you adhere to it, you get rid of some very disagreeable questions which force themselves on you if you refuse to adopt it. But if the questions referred to are asked with a view to determining whether the new way of ideas comports with facts, then we have a different matter on our hands. Into this question I cannot go at present. However, there are some questions which force themselves on me when I try to accept the new scheme on which the definitions rest. Is not the scheme a thoroughgoing idealism and a subjective idealism at that? But to guard against misunderstanding and putting the question, let me hasten to say at once I do not conceive the point of view underlying these definitions to be idealistic. If the connotation of idealistic is adapted to that of idea in the scheme, the studies in logical theory admit the existence of facts, as well as of ideas, each defined in a special way. Professor Dewey, therefore, has a perfect right to repel the suggestion that his scheme is idealistic, if idealism is defined according to idea in that scheme. We all remember how mildly indignant Bishop Berkeley used to get when the suggestion arose that his way of ideas did away with matter. He easily showed that it did no such thing. Did not the whole choir of heaven and furniture of earth find its place in his idealism? And what is meant by matter anyway, but just such things as make heaven vocal and earth comfortable? But I believe that it is fairly settled these days, if it were ever doubted, that the fact that Barclay's view admitted these material things did not make his doctrine non-idealistic. There is a current definition of idealism according to which we gauge systems as idealistic or not. Is Professor Dewey's system idealistic according to this definition? Idealism seems to be generally applied to any theory which regards all reality as embraced within experiences or within experience. It is the view that recognizes no residual reality uncatalogued after the inventory of all experience is taken. The thinker called idealistic may not even use the term experience, but we can see from his writings whether, if he had used that term as it is now generally used, he would have been willing to say with Mr. Bradley, I am driven to the conclusion that for me experience is the same as reality. The fact that falls elsewhere seems in my mind to be a mere word and a failure, or else an attempt at self-contradiction. It is a vicious abstraction whose existence is meaningless nonsense and is therefore not possible. Footnote, Appearance and Reality, 2nd edition, page 145. End footnote. If any thinker endorses these words, he is an idealist. And when any of Professor Dewey's critics calls him idealistic, the critic uses the term in this current sense. When Professor Dewey repudiates the epithet, does he use the term in another sense? If so, are they not both right, each in his own way? Professor Dewey hardly refutes the claim of his opponent by failing to meet the claim on its own grounds. A clear, unambiguous answer from Professor Dewey to the question whether he is an idealist in the current sense of idealism as defined above would, I am sure, 
make his views much more intelligible. Most of his readers have found him idealistic, only to be told that they are miserably mistaken. This has left them miserably nonplussed. If Professor Dewey thinks that it is too much of an accommodation to the weakness of his readers to answer the above question, he can at least tell us what he means by idealism when he denies that he is an idealist. And if, in the definition, he employs the term idea, he can tell us whether that term is to be taken in the sense of the studies in logical theory. Footnote. While I am asking questions, I should like to put another. What does Professor Dewey mean by rationalism and rationalistic? The rationalism of the Aufklärung we think we know, and we know that we are not rationalists of that sort. But we do not know whether we are rationalists in this seemingly new and derogatory sense in which the term is frequently used in his recent writings. It is natural that we do not like to be charged with being rationalists without being allowed to plead guilty or not guilty with the law of the term before us. End footnote. But, of course, when experience is used in the definition of idealism, we have another difficulty. What is meant by experience? The ordinary man, in his ordinariness, uses this term as in the first instance not inclusive of all reality, for he seems to find experience a very shifting thing. What is part of experience at one time is not part of it at another. Even if experience be used in the most inclusive sense as embracing ideas, guesses, hypotheses, theories, as well as facts, still these, of course, are in constant flux, as pragmatism tells us. Not only do these unstable beings chasse backwards and forwards in the figures they describe, but they often chasse incontinently out of these figures altogether. When this evanishment occurs, the ordinary man is apt to say that the wayward beings are no longer parts of the experience. Experience goes along without them. Yesterday I saw a certain stone by a brookside. Today I remember that I saw it. In the interval, I neither saw it nor remembered seeing it, nor had the least inkling of its presence. Abait, excessit, evasit, erupit. Its eruption was clean out of experience. Experience, thus used, is a most labile thing. But this very slipperiness and instability is a part of its essence in ordinary thought. But there is another meaning of the term, an extraordinary meaning, but nevertheless prevalent in philosophical writings. Out of this experience there is no exit, not even by way of fire escape. It does even more for what we in our finitude and mutability lose from time to time than what the Grecian urn does for the lover and his lady. The urn stereotypes just one moment of their lives. Forever wilt thou love and she be fair. But experience stereotypes all the moments of all lives. Everything that was or is or ever shall be upon the bosom of a flowing river where it is both fixed and fluid. Either kind of experience has its difficulties for experience although we are told that neither kind has any for experience. But either kind is just what it is, and not what it is not. It contains just what it contains, and not what it does not. Professor Dewey will have none of the capitalized sort, yet he will have nothing that is not experience. But as we have seen, lowercase experience has no room for vanished stones, except as memories which themselves vanish most of the time. And this seems to be the reason why the humanistic pragmatist turns stones into self-supporting experiences. In this, Professor Dewey disdains to follow the humanist. Now the question is whether Professor Dewey uses experience in some other sense than one of those above mentioned. If he does not, is he not a subjective idealist? He is full of admiration for the miracle which the epistemologist works in getting his ideas united with fact. The epistemologist would feel justified in retorting the admiration if the pragmatist should attempt to make fragmentary and elusive experience without a purchase in something more permanent, bring out of non-existence just what it always needs for the solution of its logical puzzles. But if what has disappeared from experience still lives on in spite of its disappearance, and yet does so in no eternal experience, then how does this way of taking experience and its needed complement differ from strictly objectivistic realism? But how, according to the studies, can what vanishes from experience continue to exist, except as a sheer, unwarranted abstraction from the standpoint of organized or reorganized experience. There is one further difficulty that I wish to lay before Professor Dewey in connection with this new distinction between fact and idea. I suppose that most of us accept the other side of the moon as a fact, on a par as fact with this side of it. If we do not accept it, there seems to be considerable disturbance in experience, which I believe will continue in most of us till the other side gets accepted. Then it becomes fact. This fact, while as accepted fact it is on a parity with this side of the moon, yet as experienced fact seems to differ considerably from it. I can see the one, I cannot see the other. 
Grant that the term sensation would lose its ordinary acceptation and become merely a term to mark an instrument or crisis in the development of inferential conclusions. Still there is, after the conclusion is reached that the moon has two hemispheres, a considerable difference in our experience between the two hemispheres, and this difference does not seem to budge however we may pry upon it with changed meanings of terms. The realist, following the ordinary usage, says that while there are two lunar hemispheres, only one can be immediately experienced, and the other is acceptable to us only by means of idea. If he is forced to accept the Chicago lexicography, he finds himself at a loss to express himself on this point, but unfortunately he does not find any loss of the fact to be expressed. What is pragmatism going to do with this difference? If it ignores it, can it keep peace with science, a peace it is proud of proclaiming as one of its achievements? Science makes a thoroughgoing distinction between observation and inference, between empirical facts and scientific constructions upon the basis of facts. Now it is one of the great merits of the studies that it has pointed out the ambiguous nature of much of what is taken by science to be fact and what is taken to be theory. But may not the ambiguity be pressed just a little too far? What we take to be a satellite 240,000 miles distant from the planetary Earth may after all not prove to be what we think it is. But suppose that such a change in scientific construction should ever take place. All is not lost from present scientific fact. There remains the fact that there is a bright something, occasionally in experience, growing from slender crescent to full orb. This fact antedated Ptolemy, and has long survived Copernicus, and will, I think, survive Copernicanism, if the latter, having had its day, should ever cease to be. This fact may come to be interpreted as anything you please, and get accepted as that thing, but it will be there to be accepted somehow whenever any one constituted like us opens his eyes and turns them in the right direction at an opportune time. This kind of fact, and there are many of them, forms the inexpungible datum of thought. It is the givenest of givens, datissimum datorum. Thought does not seem to have anything to do with the making of it, although the idealist has another account of the matter. Nor can thought do much in the way of changing these datissima. Footnote, how much thought can do in this matter is an interesting question which we cannot enter into here. End footnote. Not only do they constitute the prime starting point of all scientific problems, but they retain their pristine character throughout the thought process and after thought has done its perfect work. While the ideas and data of secondary order play their game of hide-and-seek with each other, these data of the first order are in the game, but not of it. They give to one lunar hemisphere a primacy, which no terrestrial thought reorganization can give to the other. Now a philosophy which keeps close to experience cannot well ignore this distinction between the two kinds of data. Bow the difference out of the front door by refusing to recognize it under its old style of difference between sensation and idea, and it will come in at the back door unnamed but no less obtrusive. Can logic afford to ignore it? If it does not ignore it, can pragmatic logic fix it somewhere, amid this dance of plastic circumstance that it portrays so well, but which the old logic would fain arrest? Can it fix it there without giving up the thorough plasticity of circumstance? End of The Chicago Idea and Idealism by Evander Bradley McGilvery